Mel, do you do I need to unpin you or something? No, I'm all good. Okay, cool. All right. Hey, welcome everybody. I'm seeing people slowly come in. Welcome to Ben's Book Club, the club, the Ben's Book Clubbers. We need like a theme song or something, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds um, good. Yeah, you reckon? I've got a guitar. Yeah. I, could actually... I was going to say, you play, don't you? So you can yeah, look, just yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. Ben's Book Club. <laughs> Ben's Book Club with Petronella. I don't sing. I love it. That's good. I, I don't sing. I'm sorry, everybody who's bore witness, bad witness to that. It was a bit of a shame. When I was in the band, I was actually banned from singing because I was that bad at it. I tried once. Like, I tried to sidle up to the mic. The singer afterwards... is like not for you buddy put where you're from in the chat we love to see just where everyone's from i saw the tasmanian libraries were talking today about a few people at attending so i'd love to see if anyone's made it from tasmania but yeah where are you guys from melbourne i do hope everyone's surviving all these floods oh my god yeah. i just saw some um, pictures from a friend today and oh the amount of water is ridiculous Oh, wow. Look at all these people. Oh, a few Tassie Hello. Tasmanians coming through. Adelaide. Bathurst. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they, wouldn't they have just seen you in Bathurst? They did just see me in Bathurst. <laughs> Thank you, Kath, for coming again. <laughs> oh, wow. We've got a lot of people here. Oh, look I'm at in this. California. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's awesome. Cabby Cabby Land, Sunshine Coast. Very nice. Two people from there. Brisbane. Okay. Yeah, represent. It's my hometown now. Represent Brisbane. Fantastic. And some Sydney people, Melbourne people, Victoria people. Yeah, much love to everyone out there. Um, with the like Petronella was saying, with all the flooding and stuff. It's I really love doing this. I love that we can all gather around books and wonderful authors and meet up, uh, even though it's online. It's really cool. I just I find it's, you know. Once they invent teleporters, then we'll actually be in the same room. <laughs> well, it's just, it is very lovely to see all these different places. Um, yes, Harvey Bay, Harrington, all the way up, Sydney, Sydney, Central Coast. Mm. Wonderful. And Southern California, I'm impressed. I'm impressed by Southern California. 1 Southern a. California may be the biggest reach we've had. Yeah. I'm impressed too, yeah. so Middle of the night. That's would very, it be, very Would it tiring. be the middle of the night over there or in the morning? They, or... The person, that I've lost the person. The person said 1 a.m. Tracy, Tracy, 1 a.m. 1 a.m., wow. She wins a prize, I think. She wins a prize. I think we need <laughs> some sort of prize, absolutely. <laughs> and someone from Berlin who is... Um, in the Blue Mountains. That's awesome. Just finished the lies today, Victoria. I just, yeah. Did you smash through the last? So I read the book in a day. Like I was oh. so, <laughs> I was camping. So there was no technology, but yeah. it was just, man, it was so fun. It was, su oh. it's such a good read and it's so gripping. Um, we'll start today um, just by acknowledging that I am currently speaking from Turbul land and Petronella, where are you from? I'm, um, I'm on Gadigal land on the northern beaches in Sydney. Yeah. Um, and we'd like just introduce Petronella to everybody. Um, her debut novel, Six Minutes. Uh, I haven't read Six Minutes. I'm lazy. I'm sorry, but I will get to it because I do love your writing. <laughs> that was published in July 2019. And it was actually shortlisted in the 2020 Ned Kelly Awards uh, by the Australian Crime Writers Association and the Sisters in Crime David Awards. That's a huge accomplishment uh, for anybody. Like, well done. That's Thank amazing. You. Yeah, it was, a, um, it was a surprise. You know, when you when you find, your aim is to get a book published and then you don't yeah. think any further ahead than that. So it was so, so lovely. It was I feel like you start with, I just want to have a book read. Yeah. <laughs> and then the next step is published and the next step, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you also released The Good Teacher, um, which I have here. I was going to ask you a couple of questions about that one. This is the first book that I've read from you. Uh, I love this book. I am a teacher. So, <laughs> a good uh, teacher, I hope. A good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's about me. My life story. I am a good teacher. <laughs> that was awesome. And again, you were long listed uh, in the Sisters in Crime David Award. So consistently putting out some excellent work. And then The Liars, which we're here to talk about today. 
uh, published in September this year. So this is a brand new one that we've all had the treat of reading. Um, just a couple of quick questions, uh, sorry, a couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, so everyone who's new to Ben's book club, uh, in the chat, I'm just putting a very quick link to our Facebook group. Um, we've got about 150 members on there now, and we're constantly talking about really cool stuff to do with the book club and just asking questions of each other. So if you are interested, just click that link and you can join there. Um, I also wanted to make mention to part of the fun of doing Ben's book club is to actually get some questions from our audience for Petronella. So if you have questions, if there's just, I mean, Victoria, I think you, yeah, you just finished listening to the audiobook today, just dying to ask Petronella some questions. Um, please pop them in the chat. Um, and we're also going to start with talking a little bit about you, Petronella, if that's okay. And we will be moving into a spoiler section. And I'm going to like sign, like do a wave or a signal or something. So if you haven't finished the book yet, you do, please don't stay for the spoiler section. Yeah. Um, you do want to read this book fresh and actually get the whole twist and everything in there. But we yeah. do have a couple of questions about it. Um, so Petronella, yeah. how long has this been a dream of yours? To write and publish fiction? Because I know you've also published some nonfiction as well. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I think all my whole life. I mean, I, I was an early reader. I loved reading. Um, I read a lot as a child. I was the one, you know, under the bed clothes with the torch at night, <laughs> always reading. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then as a child, I wrote a lot of um, just, well, I think I was looking for mysteries, but I grew up on a farm and there were not that many mysteries, but I started writing spaceship stories and, you know, animals that could talk, a bit of Beatrix Potter. Yeah. Um, so I think I always wanted to write, but I, somehow I knew that writers didn't get paid very much. So <laughs> I thought how did I, you know that? I don't know how I knew that, but uh, so instead of, uh, I, I went into a writing job in marketing communications yeah. And um, and I was always writing a little bit on the side, but I think finally um, when I went on maternity leave, then I found the time to kind of mm. uh, try and write a whole a full length novel. So uh, it just took me longer than I expected. I was, you know, working full time, like, you know, just juggling, juggling children, work and the rest of it. So it just took yeah. longer. Than yeah, I this is my life. This is where I'm at <laughs> right now. And so when you were when you were juggling all of that, how many like how were you finding time to write like what were you doing I'm only asking because I don't know how to do it <laughs> well, I, yeah so I don't know whether I entered a new season after writing like my last thing but I've just gone into this season where it just seems like life has stepped up the kids are a bit older in school yeah. now and I just I don't seem to have the mental capacity to write as much so yeah when yeah. you were looking at it through that that lens of fitting it in was it difficult to write without the space around you to really think through your stories as much. Yeah, it was. And I think when the kids were quite, were younger, I used to think, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll do some work on a sun, Sunday. Like I, I was in Canberra and I used to go to the National Library and do some work there while my husband looked after the kids. But I, later I realised to keep this, you need to, especially when you're writing a novel, you need to keep the story in your head. Yeah. So, in fact, it was better for me rather than trying to get four hours in the library on a Sunday. I, it was better for me to wake up early and do half an hour a day in the like early in the morning before everyone else got up. And I'm not a morning person, but I'm. Um, but now I am. I get up early and I write every morning, and then I find that the story stays in my head. And I think that works a lot better because your subconscious is working. So I'll go to bed and yeah. I'll wake up with an idea or where it should go next because this yeah, is right. working well. And do you yeah. sort of end off each day's sort of session? Is that the sort of current way that you currently work? You write every morning? Yeah, yeah. And do you sort of end off each session like knowing what you will attack the next day you don't sort of uh, well then I go back to it later on so I, I'm doing some other I'm doing a bit of other work but mostly I'm writing novels now but I'm doing some freelance work as well mm -hmm. um no I don't always know sometimes I just finish and I go oh I hope it comes to me tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> blank page and you the next yeah, day yeah and I That's wake up scary. and there's a it, I don't know there's something there's something about that discipline of um sitting down to the sitting down to the page every morning and um and the ideas are ready if i don't i don't look at social media don't talk to anyone don't mm. look at any news and then it's just that's my most creative time i think it is a real it's absolutely a discipline i think yeah. i think it's like i think it's like exercise and now that i've stopped 
going to the gym regularly, you know, it's like, I'm like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to get back there, but I'm sure I'll get there. Um, yeah, yeah, it's actually inspirational. Thank you. I think. Oh, I'll... And I just think because in before I always thought I need I need four hours or six hours. I need a big, long day. But actually, it, that doesn't work because you can only get the big long day once every two weeks or once a month, and yeah. then and then you need to start again. What was my story? Where was I going? Who are the characters? You've so just yeah. yeah, even if you do just even and even if you're not writing each day, just thinking about the story, making some notes, yeah, so it's in your head. Yeah, and I I, I tend to write in about thirty minute, one hour chunks at best. Is that sort of where you're at with it, or do you go a bit longer now? um yeah I go longer but then I then I'm not really doing anything worthwhile <laughs> I should just write it I should just write short and then do something else and come back to it but, oh man um and so your books I think would be placed within a kind of crime writing thriller category they're not sort of they're not who done it, but it's sort of like how will this tense situation unfold and then I guess there are a little bit like this one the lies has a, a real central mystery to the center of it would you classify your things as crime writing or thriller writing? Uh, I think well, I sort of say psychological suspense, um, mm. domestic noir. We were talking about domestic noir and laughing at the Frenchness of domestic noir. But uh, <laughs> uh, I think that I, it's, you know, it's about family and relationships and communities. Mm. So you've got that kind of, and I guess that's what I mean by domestic. Um, not that it's, you know, people in the kitchen. It's more about, you know, a family situation. It's not about spies yeah. and oh, there is politics. Oh, anyway, maybe I should take out domestic. Community, <laughs> community, community suspense, psychological thriller. Yeah, but it's, I think domestic sort of suggests that it's much more down to earth, I think. Like yeah. it's less like the crime writing where you read about a detective and you read about etc. It's much more set like you say centered on families and mm. and family dynamics and and relationships yeah. um who are you who are your biggest influences if you had to name some other authors who or even tv um, or where do you get your influences well i grew up reading agatha christie and stephen king mm -hmm. <laughs> A bit of horror and a bit of um, crime mystery. I can see both of them yeah. in there, I think, yeah. yeah. And I did, a, I loved reading Jodie Picoult. Um, that was sort of my well, early 20s, I guess. Um, but I love Leanne Moyarty and, um, mm. yeah, I, but I read a lot. So I, I always, I think I get something from every book I read. Um, yeah, for sure. And it might be good or bad, but... <laughs> So, I mean, I might think I don't want to do it that way, or I do yeah. want to do it that way. Or, yeah. Yeah, you absolutely can learn from. You know, you can watch some trash TV, and you learn heaps about what not to do. But also, maybe they've got some ideas in there. It yeah. must have been cool when you got Leanne's quotes, right? Oh yes. Right. Yes. On both these. <laughs> yes, that was wonderful. Wait. So this one says impossible to put down. On that was on six minutes. Yeah. Right. And then this one, it says one of my favorite Australian writers. That's amazing. So it must have been really cool if she's one of those heroes that you have. Yeah. yeah. That's very cool. Um, what can I also ask this question? I know this might be a bit of a strange one, but what is your like most favorite novel of all time? Like one of those ones that you read every year as a routine, uh, just love it. Yeah. I don't actually reread novels. Should I admit to that? I don't know. I, I might get I might get slaughtered in the in the um, no in the what? chat. But I don't I don't reread novels. I um ever rarely, rarely. Wow. Okay. Um, What's wow? Why? <laughs> well, I think I love the surprise of a novel, and once mm. you've read it, the surprise is gone. I mean, sometimes I'll have I'll sort of skip through and look at oh, how did they do that, and how did they set that up, but um. But I think one of my favourite novels is Gone Girl and it was just such a surprise and such a shock <laughs> and cleverly constructed. Um, and it, I think it did sort of start that genre, you know, set off this genre of domestic thriller in a way. Sure, um, sure. And the same um, about, um, we need to talk about Kevin, I think, <laughs> a shocking book. <laughs> I haven't read that one. Oh, you haven't read it. Uh -huh. no. I wait. Uh, yeah. Anyway, that's quite a shocking book to read. Okay. And I also, should, I, I should read it. Construction. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you work in a school. I don't know. It's a. You know. 
it's a um it's a, a mass shooting in a high school i don't know oh, okay. i don't know if you want to read that or not well know. Yeah, I don't shy away from reading things that are a bit shocking and provocative. I think I could read that. It might hit a bit too close to home at points. Yeah. You know, that's what good novels can do. Um, can I talk? I know this might be a weird question as well. I've got lots of weird questions. Um, <laughs> Far away. <laughs> yeah, this cover. Yeah. Really cool. Both. I mean, both of these. I haven't got six minutes. I'm sorry. But that also had a really. Yeah, it's got that yellow cover. I remember the cover. Yes. So like, look at so, these three. Look how well they sit with each other. Yeah, they do, they have really um the marketing, the branding has been very very well done. It's um, been really cool. Yeah. What's it like? Do you do you think do you place value on book covers? Um, I do, but I I see that because I think it's the first thing you know someone sees on the shelf unless they're borrowing it from the library through audio. <laughs> mm. Well, I think you still see the cover. Um. And I think, yeah, I think if you get the wrong cover, then people are expecting a different sort of book. So mm. I think you want the book to say, to give an insight into what it's going to be about, and what sort of style it is. Yeah. Is that how you choose which books you'll read is by looking at covers or do you sort of, well, how do you choose what you're going to read? Uh, I, I have a lot of people say, oh, this book's coming out or that book's coming out or there's a great new book by Ben Hobson coming out soon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So a lot of um, a lot of chit chat from uh, from people people in the industry. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, I sort of do the same thing. I think um, I wanted to also talk about the good teacher, which I really loved. Um, I wanted to talk about, and this is just a question about this novel and the writing process mostly. But what's a big? If you had to reflect on this, what's a big lesson that you learned from writing this book? that you've then taken into writing the lies and something that you'll, you know, maybe it's something to do with editing or maybe there was a story thread that went in one direction. You're like, oh, I won't do that thing again. Yeah. Is there any lessons from this book? Well, the lesson from that book or the editing lesson I had from that book was I, I originally, so that book set in, um, I think it's set in three terms, um, term one, term two, term three for a school year. And originally and there is this sort of um, writing advice: start as close to the um, as close to not as close to the climax or as close to the action as possible. Mm. So when I first wrote *The Good Teacher*, I started in term two, when a lot of stuff was sort of backstory. Yeah. And then the editor got it and said, "I think you're starting too late in the story. We need mm. to know the characters better. We need to know. We need to set up more." So. I then, so in the editing process, I added 15 chapters to the beginning, <laughs> 13, maybe it was 13, to That's term one. So I, I had some of it, so, so some of it I'd written in backstory, but I then I had to re, rewrite and pull it all out. That's 13. Look at yeah. the, look at that. <laughs> yeah. You added all that on the front. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I moved some of it. Some of it was in there, but as backstory. And then, it, so it became front story. Um but now I said, but then I got comments saying, oh, it's a bit slow to start. So now, <laughs> from readers, not from the editor. <laughs> That's funny. Oh, yeah. so it's hard to know. Hard can't, to know. Win, can't win, can't win. Um, no, nah, it's an awesome book. Um, I wanted to ask also, um, I wanted to ask about The, the Good Teacher, which, which came out in 2020 and it was during COVID. And I was wondering what the differences are now in having The Liars come out and what you've sort of seen uh, I guess the book industry and, and writing and reading and sort of those, the, you know, fans of your work, what, what's yeah. the differences now when you're actually getting out to meet people? Yeah, so I did a lot of, I mean, I did a lot of The Good Teacher online and talked to book clubs online and talked to people online, which is great because, you know, and it was great at the time because we could still do something, but it has been wonderful. I've just done a seven-week sort of book tour around New South Wales and a bit down to Melbourne and Canberra. And it's just been so nice to talk to people face to face, and mm. and and then we can discuss. Like in this, we're gonna we're gonna talk about spoilers later. But you know, in a in real life, then you can talk one on one about spoilers, and people want to ask about the ending, and that. Yeah, <laughs> so that's yeah. been that's, that's been really good, and to get just get that enthusiasm again about um, seeing people um, and being in bookshops, all of that. It's it's been great, really, really good. I really do feel like we need to invent some sort of teleporter because I don't know how to do what we're doing here with all the people here in real life, but man, it would be fun, wouldn't it? Just 
It would. Getting together. We could um, have holograms this... of ourselves or something. Oh, it's a great idea. Like we could all be in a room track. together. But anyway, this is but this is great, and I and this is I the agree. first time. This is my first book club about the lies. So um, before I've been doing author talks about without without spoilers, without people having all read it. So this is mm -hmm. exciting. All right. Well, let's get into the let's get into the nitty gritty of of the lies. Um, so yeah, we will start to uh, when there's a few questions I have before we reach into actually talking yeah. about spoilers. Trish, I, we will get there. I promise. We'll get there. Trish in the in the <laughs> chat. Um, uh, but so yeah if you if you feel like you you don't want the book spoiled and you haven't quite managed to finish it it's probably a good idea to to bow out and maybe five or six questions time yeah. um but i can say that it has been yeah it's just such a thrilling you know what i'm gonna leave a few questions until a bit later <laughs> i want to ask um let's just ask this question first of all where was the inspiration where did you get the inspiration for this particular story what really brought this story into your mind yeah, well, um, and those who read it will know that there's sort of three different stories in there and, you know, it's this mm -hmm. kind of complex plot. Um, but one of the storylines was when my daughter was inspired by when my daughter suddenly turned 15 and said, oh, mum, I want to go to this beach party. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, God, I know those beach parties. I remember them. But now I'm the mother. Oh, my God. <laughs> I remember those beach parties myself, yeah. yeah. And at the time, I it was just it was sort of, it must have been December, just before the pandemic, perhaps December 2019 or January 2020. And, um, and I thought, oh, things have changed a bit since I was a teenager. You know, girls are treated with more respect. And then, yeah, and then the whole, well, she told me a few things that were happening. And then we had Chanel Contos in the Sydney doing a survey of these private schools private schools in eastern Sydney mm. uh, about sexual assault at teenage parties and then you know Brittany Higgins in Parliament House and then we're marching for justice for women again so my story idea kind of changed from originally it was going to be an overprotective mother and a 15 year old daughter and something had happened to the mum and she was sort of you know but the, but the daughter's situation was different whereas now it became a parallel of three stories across um three different timelines that are fairly similar um, mm. and things hadn't changed i mean i think there is some there is change happening just um not as not as quickly as we'd like it no and it's a bit hard to also guarantee like change in every single person like you'll still have oh yeah yeah it's a bit hard yeah, yeah. but um, it's also i mean it's also the law and the police it's all the in terms of, of how women are treated um, yeah. And then another part of the story, I read an article about a, um, a massacre of Indigenous people down in South Australia, mm -hmm. in the town down there, and they wanted to um, set up a memorial to the victims, but no one could agree on the history of what happened, whether, you know, two people were killed in this massacre, whether anyone was killed in this massacre, whether 200 people were killed. And I just thought, wow, there's all these different opinions and how can that town move forward? How can mm -hmm. you agree when you can't agree on it? On you know what was the history of the town? Um, so I wanted to explore that idea as well. Yeah, it's also um, you know so it's also an act of you know maybe just putting aside what you think and listening to someone mm -hmm. else who might know more than you do about that particular history, right? And yeah, yeah, it's a sad thing this debate that goes on about the history of Australia in regards yeah. to a, a lot of those stories of massacres and things. And that mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who just don't listen. And I thought your book, yeah, I thought your book did a, a, such an amazing job oh, of you. of um, painting Sienna. She is such an interesting teenager. Like she is a bit, she's a bit naive, but she's also so passionate and she's yeah. quite confident. Um, she's also very smart, very intelligent. Um, but just the way she sort of bumbles into... Yeah speaking on behalf of first nations people yeah. and then and then learning about that like i just thought that was so good that was such a clever framing and when she started to speak i was sort of like oh okay she's sort of but i don't know i just thought you did that really well how was that what was that like to handle that um you know well uh, understandably sensitive topic yeah so i did the, i did a lot of research and i spoke to a lot of people and um and i was nervous and worried and i think really that's part of the reason i decided to write 
you know, mm-hmm. what she's, what, how she's fumbling around and getting it wrong mm-hmm. um, and how her mother knows much more about, you know, how the media is writing about Indigenous issues and that sort of thing, um, whereas she's not quite getting it where she doesn't understand. Um, and, you know, and I love the passion. Wants to help, though. Like, her yeah. passion oh, is yeah. so good. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's, you know, that's not just teenagers. There's a lot of people who are very passionate about them kind of don't quite get it right and um, then kind of set things back rather than take it forward. Um, yeah. And we're in a society that's very quick to sort of jump on to mm. something without maybe thinking things through sometimes. And I thought yeah. you did a, a good job of sort of, you know, I know there's no, it's not being didactic and talking through your novel and sending a message out, but it's just yeah. such an interesting character and what she goes through, I think does mirror a lot of experiences of Australians mm-hmm. and people around the world as they sort of realize that maybe they should listen a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I just thought you did such a good job yeah. with that. Um, but yeah, let's talk about, you've got lots of so many different um, points of view in this mm-hmm. novel. Um, how do you, how do you go about, cause each of the different perspectives felt really unique. And the, and the voice felt just very particular. Like I knew exactly who uh, who was speaking in each section. So do you sort of have like a character map up on your wall of when each character has a chapter or how do you how do you go about constructing that sort of story? Yeah, I feel I should be far more um, <laughs> analytical about it, but really I just I just write it. Um, I use Scrivener so I can see whose ch- who's chapter point of view we're up to and I guess it's really whose part of the story is it next um, and who's got the information that they need to get out and who's got the action. Um, but it's so evenly balanced, like you don't spend half the book with one character and then, oh, I forgot about so-and-so. They all have their story. Yeah, yeah, I, and, and I guess I feel that moves it along too. Like that's why I like to do it. And I like to see things from different points of view. That's what I love about reading. It's mm-hmm. getting into different heads. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I do it. There you go. That's, a, that's not a very helpful answer. That's a, no, it's very annoying how naturally good you are at that. Clearly. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, just as a reminder to everyone in chat, if you have any questions for Petronella, just pop them in the chat. We've got a couple here. Um, we've got something from Marie saying, good to hear that you don't reread me either. So you're not alone in that boat there. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> and Trish, we are going to get to your question as well. Definitely. Yep. Um, let's talk a little bit about a couple of the characters too. In addition to Sienna, let's talk about Mary. How would you char- characterize Mary? And, um, sort of what went into crafting her because she is the mum as you were discussing earlier she's sort of you with your team yeah no okay no (laughs) well I think they're all I mean all of them are like 10% me perhaps yeah yeah. um I guess Mary is most like me and she what I was interested in her was this idea of female ambition that never gets to take off she's always wanted to leave town she wants to go and work overseas as a journalist but she can never um she can't she doesn't do it because of her mum getting sick and then she gets pregnant and I think then there's this this resentment that you know Rollo is setting up his business the kids are doing their thing but she's still kind of stuck in this role that yeah. she never wanted to be in well that she's she's had to take um and then she can't really see the value of that role until until the end of the story when she does but um yeah so I think I was interested in that that and that, and that balance as well, you know, caring for your for your mum, your children, your, your husband's business, the whole thing, and trying to earn money, you know, just real life, really. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then and then she's as as we'll get to later, but she's very um, very uh, morally straight about what she believes in. Mm-hmm. So um, I guess I guess Mary and Detective Paul are both kind of moral compasses for the story in terms mm. of uh in terms of the crimes that are happening and what's what's going on yeah yeah no that i appreciate that answer i think i agree with you mary's mary is that moral compass as is paul um got a quick question here from stacy it won't take very long to answer this one we're just sort of going back to writing craft stuff um how many words per day do you write do you set a goal for yourself to write this many words and then you shut down or how do you go Wow, I'm impressed, Stacey. That's impressive. Five thousand. No, that's a, that's a, that's <laughs> that's ridiculous. That's a lot. <laughs> that's very good. Very good. Um, I I think I um I write around 
two to, two to three thousand words a day when I'm in the middle of um, in the middle of you know writing writing. Um, so I write a I write a fast first draft and then I do a lot of editing. So a lot of my work is in yeah a lot of my work is in rewriting or editing. So yeah, I do about a thousand words a day when I'm really cooking, and it normally takes me about thirty minutes to an hour. Yeah. Um, but five, can I ask you, Stacey, how long five thousand words a day takes you? Like, is that an eighteen-hour workday for you? That's incredible. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> John coming in. Is there a sequel to The Liars? I think we're getting to where we need to talk about it. <laughs> oh, wow, Stacey. Two to three that's hours for 5,000 words. That's a lot. Wow. That's You'd be that churning out how many, like if it's 80,000 words a book, 5,000, that's like a book a month just about. That's incredible. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, yeah, is, is there a sequel to The Liars? I think people <laughs> want to talk about this ending. <laughs> Can I first just say, uh, I'll just, I was just going to say back to Mary, um, I also yeah. was interested in in um, a marriage where, so with Mary and Rollo, that, um, and I think this is true in, in a lot of relationships, that one one person's ambition has to take the second, you know, second second yes. thing to the to the other person. So yeah. she's kind of, um, you know, she's got the regular income. She's had to help him set up his business. He's succeeding. He's really happy, but she's still kind of resentful. Um, I, I agree with that. I think that's the case in my marriage certainly that there have been like right now you know Lena's out there cooking pizzas for the boys and they're out there watching tv in the next room while I do this you know we sort of need to rely on each other absolutely Mm. um I guess it's a shame when it takes you know decades for Mary to to find that spark and that passion and come back to you yeah Mm. you know what I mean like yeah if it's a bit more evenly balanced that would be better um Hopefully I do that in my own marriage. I'll ask, I'll ask Lena afterwards. <laughs> we, we've moved into marriage counselling tonight on Ben's Book Club. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Maurice, thank you so much. I'm really sorry that we're going to get into spoilers, but thank you for coming. She's going to actually leave. Smart, you want to you wanna leave. But please check in with the Facebook group afterwards. I'm very interested in your thoughts. Um, let's talk about the ending. Um, first of all, We will talk about uh, Caroline, Caroline, who uh, is the wife of Detective Poole, who winds up being, I was going to say the big bad, but not the big bad, really sort of, but sort of, Mm. I'm just so interested. How did you, first of all, how did you make it so that when the revelation happens that it is Caroline doing this and she was the childhood friend and all those sorts of things, or sorry, the student friend. Um, How did you make it feel like that was the most natural conclusion? And I I sort of thought, ah, but I still didn't see it coming. How did you hide that from me? What did you do? Um, I gave you a lot of red herrings. That's what I did. I I knew you did. (laughs) I I fell for them, every one of them. Um, I really wanted to have that anonymous, uh, the anonymous narrator for those chapters, but then that, because I wanted the reader to have some insight into what was really happening, what was behind the scenes, um, but they're quite hard to write because I wanted, I couldn't let it sound like it was a woman because there weren't many women to be, um, yeah, that's you true. know, because there was only Mary and Caroline and one of the two others, there was, there were very few people. Um, yeah, look, some Emily's actually. Yeah, no, no, that. Emily, that's no. I tried to make it sound quite male, but but also I didn't want to trick the reader. So you can't, you know. So the the language you use is Caroline's language was far more um, sophisticated and academic, and and originally I'd had the language very blokey. So I, yeah, I I had to play with it quite a lot. They were quite tricky sections, um, and then I guess I looked at what you know. In terms of red herrings, how could I set it up? How who else would want these boys dead? You know, mm. is it a drug deal gone wrong? Is it um, is it a you know a, a toxic masculinity, homophobe killing? So yeah. I, I was trying to set yeah. up all those other uh, ideas, which which are not. I mean, they're not just ideas because I did a lot of research on um, the gay killings in Sydney in the 80, 80s. Mm. Um, and, you know, and that's part of, it's part of many small towns, not that I'm just generalising there, sorry. <laughs> it's part of life. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's part of Australian 
culture about um unfortunately yeah, yeah. but I, I just thought on reflecting on it it's actually fairly brilliant that the red herrings aren't just what you've put in the book they're actually red herrings that caroline mm. placed in there yes That's well i, I very like, sneaky of you yeah and i loved that so when i came up with this idea that she was she had a report about serial killings i went well, that's perfect. She can feed that to her husband and to the team, and then she can push. Uh... What? So that just fell into your lap? What do you mean? I thought that was a setup from the start. You just had her already. That's amazing. Well, no, no, no. Well, I had. I just. Well, I just thought. Of, then I added that in the report. So I thought, that's oh, cool. that'll work well. Yeah. I just um, thought that you had you had the report that you wanted him to get, and then you sort of crafted her around that. But no, it was the other way around. That's really cool. Around. Yeah. And originally, uh, originally with my ending, um, I actually had him, him realizing. But then I went, oh, if he realizes, there's no, he's, he will just send her to jail. I think he's too, you know, he's too, he's too morally. There's no ambiguity about him. Yeah, he's a straight um, arrow. Yeah. Yeah, and I didn't want her going to jail. And in fact, the the first ending I wrote was very, very um, open. And my mum read it, and she said. Where's, where's the rest of the book? Where's the last chapter? I said, no, that's the last chapter. She said, no, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I rewrote it about five times after that. And I just love the idea that, that Mary will find out. But now what will she do? Because, because she, can't, she, she can't give her up, give her up because he saved, she saved his son's life. So, yeah, yeah. So what, that, that moment too what she where do? she does save, um, she saves her son's life is so winning and and you understand her motivations you understand her and just yeah it's just i thought the creation of this character who i really wanted to i wanted her to get away yeah a little bit (laughs) that's what you wanted yeah yeah yeah. so then right at the end and i think someone mentioned it was it trish we're finally getting to your question here i think and someone else mentioned was it john yeah. asking about the sequel um yeah because the ending has that little little so good that little hint of like oh the revelation's going to drop and then i feel like book two sort of gets written in my mind because i can sort of see it is that what you sort of feel like as well yeah and i, I never like it never occurred to me i didn't leave it like i would make a sequel but so many people said, oh, will there be a sequel? And I'm like, oh, no, I think it's in your mind. You need to decide what's going to happen. It's like a choose your own venture at the end. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's, it's a really, it's a really, it's a moral dilemma for, what, for Mary, what she's going to do. It's a really difficult. Can we question. ask what you think she would do? Or is I, that too much? Have you got, uh, is that too well, much? I, I mean, I can go either way, but I don't. I think she can't. I don't think she can give her up because because of saving a son. I just don't think she could. But then she couldn't live with herself. So then, it's like she puts it back on herself. So. Mm, yeah, for sure. Yeah, mm. I don't know how she'd act. I don't know what I would do. That's it's. I think the part of the brilliance of it is that you, it would. It's such an ethical dilemma. Like I yeah. have no clue. But and also that. You know, Mary. Um, Mary hated. Um, well, I mean, she killed the wrong twin, but you know, Mary hated those boys and yeah. what they did to her. Yes. So also, she's. You know, Caroline's avenged her. She's avenged the crime against her as well. Yeah. Can we um, talk a little bit about that backstory of Mary's, which sort of is slowly teased out over the course of the novel? Um, this abuse and this trauma that was inflicted on her as a young woman at one of these beach parties. Um, Was that always sort of, you wanted that to drop a little later in the book and sort of explain a lot of her motivations that way? Or do you feel like that motivated her a lot or you know how it sort of- Motivated Mary, do you think motivated Mary? Yeah, yeah, because she acts, because she's so scared for her own daughter and she's yes. so uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, sort of cramped down on her. Yeah. But the actual revelation of what had happened to her is sort of a bit further back here. Yeah. yeah. So towards That's the back of the book. The cave. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Was that always the construction that you wanted that revelation to happen then? Because I could see a book where 
that revelation's at the front and then that helps explain why she is so restrictive. Well, I, I wanted the revelation to come along with, with Rollo saying what he knew. Um, so it's sort of pivotal to their own, you know, to their marriage, to their relationship and what they're yeah. feeling. So you so dramatise it, yeah. yeah. So I guess that's why I wanted it a bit later. And also that Mary has never told people um, that she saw him the next morning. Um, so I needed that later as well. Because um, So, yeah, I guess that's why I sort of thought um, I should do it that way. I'm, mm. glad, jo I'm glad, John, that you thought it was, or John or Sharon, thought it was Durham because I was, um, <laughs> I was trying to set Durham up. So that was good. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Um, I think I fell for every red herring. I'm going to be, I'm going to be <laughs> completely honest. I, I read these books completely taken on the ride. Oh. Um, I never um, figure anything out. Someone said to me, oh, I, I worked it out at about two thirds of the way in. And I'm like, well, that's fine. You can work it out then. That's no problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's fine. Two thirds of the way is fine. I figured it out when she said that she was married <laughs> to Detective Poole. That's when it fell in for me. Really... <laughs> Really um, cluey guy here. I also like the idea with Caroline of her then having done this thing and then feeling, um, you know, feeling guilt, feel, but but having having killed them because there's been no action from the police and and um, and she didn't mean to kill, you know, she didn't mean to kill the first one, so it's kind of um, yeah gradual. She covered um, it up, but she didn't mean to commit the yeah. crime itself. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then that she then set her whole life up not to be not to be caught and to then to go into to go into criminology to try and understand why she did it but then also to marry someone who's very respectable yeah so I just love that idea of then being so you know trying to set your life up to stop yourself from being caught from with something you did when you were how old she was yeah it's so quite when and she's sort of 19. sorry to interrupt she's she <laughs> seems quite tragic in that too like that she has to she had to do this and she will wear the guilt of it mm -hmm. as a mark of like I I will wear this guilt to sacrifice my well being for the sake of all these women who are now much more protected from yeah. these men, right? That's, yeah. yeah. So and that she wouldn't have children, that she couldn't, she could, you know, that she was too worried, and that was her kind of punishment, and too worried to have children as well. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Such a good character. Yeah um yes. we've got a got a couple of questions here um john's saying he's going to recommend the lies to my local book club as there are so many interesting issues and dilemmas to discuss oh fantastic there That's are some cool. um, book club questions on my website if you if you need them but i'm sure there's enough to discuss without having questions to guide you <laughs> yeah yeah john you probably come up with your own i think you did <laughs> um and then susan hello susan uh loyal ben's book clubber uh, the diary, mentioning the diary is such a good device to reveal Mary's character. And then yeah. Sienna finding it and Sienna being the vehicle through mm. which that diary is digested, dramatizing it. Very, very yeah. clever. When did the diary come into your mind as a kind of um, a device to reveal character? Well, originally I was going to just have flashbacks, but then it just felt there were too many time frames and too much going on. And I liked the idea of a diary that then it takes you into that really personal moment of, you know, it's it's so, um, I don't know, so visceral in a way when you're writing a diary. But the funny thing is I wrote a diary as a teenager, so I went and found them and they were so boring and so terrible. Oh, no. <laughs> they weren't as gossipy and full of drama as you wanted. Oh, no but I just I had no insight I didn't understand I was just was, I was like oh my gosh these are just awful <laughs> so no, I feel not... like that's something that you could put on your website too Petronella you should just <laughs> scan a couple of entries blackout you know redact no I think people would read no. it everyone will say how did she become a writer it's terrible <laughs> <laughs> funny funny Oh, okay. So Trish has an interesting question here. I did wonder if the fact that there were two sets of twins oh. going to turn into a backstory. What's um? I uh, forgive me. What the two sets of twins? I thought there was. Uh, so well, there have, are, of course. Yeah, yeah of so, course, the brother and sister. Yeah, Blake and. Um, yeah, that's interesting Blake, too. Um, yeah. 
Is this right? I just forgot his name. It's okay. It's been a while since you wrote it. It's fine. Anyway, I'm, I'm working on the next novel now. Yeah, um, yeah. What's his name? Derek. Thank you. Thank you, Trish. I was thinking Lance. That was the other one. Um, yeah, I, was, I wanted to sort of also give readers the idea that possibly... Um, you know, the son that had been that had died was it was the opposite son and done a you know a switcheroo, but just as a red herring. Um, but why I wanted the twins was really to create that bond between Mary and Glenda and really set up this, you know, a mothering bond sort of thing with a relationship there that then also puts Mary in a tricky position because she hates her sons and and um, the idea of nature and nurture, whether mm. that, that Glenda was so nurturing and loving. But she still had these two boys, well, at least one boy who was incredibly rotten. Yeah, rotten. Um, and then Mary's Mary's twins are quite different. They're mm. they're very caring and very socially aware. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, I guess that's, you know, going back to John, that's another interesting question, right? Like yeah. nature versus nurture, where yeah. where does this evil spring from? Yeah. Oh, and Trish, the other thing about the twins, that's the other reason I had twins. Because I liked, I wanted to um, look at the idea that ma- that parents, not just mothers, parents still treat their boys and girls, dif- their sons and daughters differently. Mm-hmm. And um, and I thought, well, then they need to be the same age. Because I've got an older son and a younger daughter and they're very different personalities. So my son never said, I want to go to a beach party because <laughs> he wasn't interested. So, yeah. um, so I just wanted to, them the same age so that the so that you can really see the difference in how the parents are treating them and they're not worried that Taj isn't on his location app and they're not really taking any notice of what Taj is doing. That's true. Yeah. They kind of forget what he's doing. They let mm. him get into his own mischief. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. 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 Again, another one of those thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah, Lynette has asked here, um, can you imagine your children <laughs> thoughts like if you published your diary <laughs> like Sienna was doing with Mary, right? Can you imagine that happening? I would die. I would die. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can I ask, have, do your kids read your books? You've got kids who are a bit older. They could probably read your books. Yeah, so my son is um, always my first reader. He's, uh, oh, so that's... He's, um, he's 20 now. But so he read Six Minutes and he's read The Good Teacher, like so early, the very first draft. And he, and he did say to me last week, Mum, when am I getting the, the new book? When's the first draft coming? That's amazing. You've yeah. got a good one there. That's, that's, yeah. That's so he's not, great. I mean, he's not quite the right readership. He does say things that I think, I go, oh, don't worry about that. You don't, <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand. But, um, and my daughter, who's now 17, has said she's waiting for the movie. <laughs> Sorry. That's amazing. So, no, good on her. So we need someone to make a movie because so my daughter yeah. can see it. <laughs> get a producer in the chat to uh, yeah. get Patronella's uh, books turned yeah. into to movies so her daughter can finally see what she's been getting into. <laughs> it's funny, though, because I, I get asked that question a lot, like, do all your family read your books? Not all of them read the type mm-hmm. of books I write. And you sort of, I used to get a bit precious about it, but you sort of have to let them go a little bit there's oh there's some support in the chat look yes. john wants the it movie be, it, i it's very atmospheric can you imagine the dead whale on the movie you, obviously not a real dead whale obviously no it's <laughs> CGI dead whale yeah, yeah it's a good point it's a lot of good visuals a lot, a lot of good visuals in the cave in the beach mm, in mm, the dark different time frame yeah it'd be very the good fire. Yeah, yeah it would be pretty cool mm. oh where's marlo where is Marlo? There's a dead whale at Marlow at the moment. We need to go out and shoot some shoot some scenes out there. East Gippsland. Oh. I'm from Gippsland. Is there really? There's a dead whale there. I didn't know that. My mum, mm. where's my mum? She needs to, <laughs> she normally sends me all the news. <laughs> Joanne's also saying terrific movie. Yeah, I think all your books would turn into fantastic yeah, films. That would be good. Yeah. Um yeah, you haven't had any sort of approaches from film producers? Oh, there's been a little bit, but nothing's happened. Um, so, yes, hopefully, hopefully this one. It's been, pitched, it's been pitched around the place. Hopefully something would happen. Well, if I had money, Petronella, I would throw it at you. <laughs> Thank you, <Ben>. <laughs> <laughs> um, Can I ask, just as a sort of a final question, we'll see if we have any more afterwards with um, the chat, but 
I want to ask if you feel this book really has a message. Like, are you an author who writes a message or do you just write a good story and messages sort of come out naturally? And if, I guess if you had to, um, if you had to pop in like a real message, like if you had to narrow it down, would you be able to? Do you think there's one central sort of like takeaway from your book? Well, I don't like to write a message. I like to look at a, an issue from different points of view, which is why I have different point of view like characters. An ex, like an exploring of it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, but I guess, I guess with this book, I guess really it, it'd be nice, apart from being a page turner, um, that people kind of think about these hidden histories and whether it's um, whether it's women or whether it's indigenous issues in the town, history in the town, but these these histories that are not talked about, the voices that are silenced. I guess mm. that's what I, you know, would like people to, as as you said, listen. I think listen is the word. <laughs> yeah, listen to other people's stories um, that don't get heard because the book is kind of about that too. It's about yeah. it's about a few people sort of learning to be brave and speaking up, but it's also every character sort of ends up having to hear one another and having mm. to listen to stories from each other. Mm. Um, yeah, every and, character uh, sort of goes through that. Yeah, and I guess for me, and I, I, I put that in the acknowledgement somewhere, but I, I grew up in Bathurst on the farm and we, didn't, we learned nothing about the Indigenous history. We learned nothing about the Wiradjuri people. And Bathurst was one of the first um, places, inland places, to be colonised. And so there was harmony but then there was war and there was um, mm -hmm. martial law at some point and and I never I never learned any of this and you know it's a it's the time I know we all didn't learn this at my age and then I went to uni and I heard something about the um about Tasmania and their Indigenous history and I was just shocked that there could be this whole yeah. other history in an education system where you know I grew up believing the education system is is the education it's the truth this is what we're learning so i think when you yeah i think that really got me thinking about mm. what who who owns the story who owns the history mm. and there's a the history teacher says you know it's the victors who write mm -hmm. i don't know what she what she says it's the victors who write the history the victors who tell the story um it's the same yeah. thing where i grew up in um in gippsland there was there was a guy who had a like a I think they're actually even talking about it now, but there was like a, a what do you call it? A totem or a, like a, a sim, like a, a statue sort of, but not of him, but like of a symbolic of his founding of the area. But um, when I wrote my other, my previous novel, I did some research on him and I found out all this stuff about him that was absolutely terrible. And I had no idea, nothing, mm. nothing was communicated, nothing was said. But I think linking that back to about, um, talking about the silence of of women and in, in the book as well you know um the uh homosexual characters as well have to mm. have to remain quiet and it's a you you hope that there's change now in our world right you hope that there's mm. more people willing to listen and hear each other mm. rather than judge and um discriminate mm. yeah john you might be right i thought it was mcmillan Sorry, John, just looking at the chat there. Churchill is the name I remember. I also remember Macmillan. I might be Macmillan, but I could be wrong. I grew up in Yarram, if you're wondering where I grew up. Um, are there any other questions for Petronella? We might end it there. I thought that was a nice way to end it off as well. Um, I guess another question, Petronella. You know, I know this is a really strong one, but what's next for Petronella? What's, I mean, I know you're working on finishing something are you able to tell us anything about your new book um yeah so my new book's due in six weeks which is a bit scary mm -hmm. uh <laughs> it will come out hopefully september next year uh and it is more family focused i have two siblings a brother and a sister i did because the lies were so complex i was thinking i just want to keep the next one Simple. simpler mm -hmm. i'm just going to have two points of view one location, one timeline, not one location, but one timeline. And I've ended up again, I don't know, with five points of view, three timelines, Pennsylvania in 1958, Philadelphia now, the snowy mountains. I'm like, what am I doing? You just can't help yourself. You've I got can't to help everywhere. myself. So I've got a lot of research to do again. <laughs> 
I can't get to Philadelphia in time, but I've been there before. Hey, you could farm some stuff out to Stacey, though. She does 5,000 oh. words a day. She might oh, yeah, be that'd be good. That'd be good, Stacey. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm really enjoying it. It's about, uh, it's about a cold case and a family, and uh, I don't want to say too much. <laughs> oh, I can see there's a few people. I think you've built some, you've got some fans here in the chat. Oh, thank you. Looking forward to your next thing. I'm looking forward to finishing writing it. Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> then, you can, then you can read it back, yeah. <laughs> I feel like that, I'm, I'm still at that stage where I can see it, it will be good. I just have to get to that next bit, yeah. <laughs> a, a bit of work to do. And then there'll be no edits because it will be perfect. I always get edits. I'm always edited in the January school holidays. It's, anyway, so that'll be me again, <laughs> editing in the January school holidays. Do you get a lot of edits? Um, normally 25 pages or so. Yeah. No, that's. <laughs> About me, that's pretty pretty average, I think. Yep, yeah. pretty good. Yeah. yeah, it can be a bit disheartening to see all those red marks all over yeah. your stuff, eh? But I love it. I like. I think it makes it makes a bit stronger. So I'm, I'm always happy. It's always yeah. about whittling down to get it to its best form, right? So I I agree. I know there are some authors who cry on the toilet when they get their edits, and yeah. we might do that for a day, but then you bounce back, all right? Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Petronella. It's been oh. a real delight to have you in the Ben's Book Club. I'm um, getting a lot of people. Thank fantastic. you, Abby. That's really. Thank you, everyone. It's been so lovely to see, hear you all, see your, I'd say, see, see your, um, see your comments and your questions. And uh, thank all you the, for... Yeah, all the things. I'm just going to put the Facebook group link in the chat again. If you're interested, guys, you can click on that link. Um, but yeah, Petronella, listen, if you read this with the Libby app, you can borrow her other book from the Libby app. But I, I think these make some really great um christmas oh presents <laughs> great do you idea. have any teachers in your life <laughs> huh? no yeah. seriously um yeah to just yeah it's really cool to be here and support australian authors and yeah. um really glad that everyone's got to be you got new fans which is really cool That's fantastic well thank you everyone for listening listening to um listening to libby listening to the the uh, audio That's, yeah uh, there's a and, few audio book and listening. those who've read it as well thank you yeah, cool. All right. Well, thanks, Petronella. And um, yeah, uh, sorry, just very quickly, next month, I'll show you the book we're doing next month. Oh, dun, 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 dun. oh. yeah. The new Craig Sylvie runt. I've been reading two chapters a night with my boys for the last few few oh. months. So this is a, a kid's book, um, sort of aimed at young adults, I guess, because it's quite big, but it's such a beautiful book. Very Roald Dali um yeah so if you're interested too if you want to bring your kids to one of these book clubs this is the one to bring them along to yeah. um i think it would be really cool to have some young questions yeah, there i actually think i'm going to get my boys in yeah, actually that's great, I, I told them already and they're extremely excited they've been crafting <laughs> their questions for craig um gtu sunshine coast oh that's awesome Wow. Okay. All right, cool. Well, thank you anyway. So thank you. And yeah, tune in next month for Runt with Petronella. You've been amazing. Really lovely to talk to you and uh, best of luck with everything and good luck finishing in the next six weeks. <laughs> thank you, Ben. I'll finish. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> It'll be great. I know you will. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thanks for being okay. here. See you at the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.